Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar where we'll be taking a look at understanding the value of water through the monetization of risks. My name is Stephen Kennett and I look after the built environment working groups here at Two Degree. I'm delighted to welcome our presenter today, Johan Clare of Veolia Water. Johan has over 10 years experience in water environmental services. He's been in charge of various strategic initiatives at the international level, including business unit integration, post acquisition, with a challenge to enhance external growth with organic growth. Since 2009, he is leading the environmental leadership program for Veolia Water worldwide, promoting new decision-making tools for sustainability, shared value creation, and innovative sustainable investment models integrating environmental externalities. He is now Director of the Business Development for Industrial Markets. Today's presentation will last for around 25 minutes, 25 minutes, which will give us 10 to 15 minutes for questions at the end. Throughout the webinar, we'll be using the hashtag TrueCostOfWater, so if you want to tweet any comments or questions, please be sure to include this. Before we begin, I'd just like to remind everyone that you can submit questions throughout the webinar using the Q&A box on the bottom right-hand side of the screen. Just type in your question and press send, and then we'll wait till the end before answering as many as we can. As an aside, if you should have any technical issues during the presentation, please use the chat box on the right-hand side to send me a message, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. So without any further delay, I'd like to hand over to Johan, who will get us started with today's presentation. So over to you, Johan. Well, uh, thank you very much, and uh, welcome to this webinar. Uh, thank you very much to Degrees for the opportunities uh, to share this game-changing uh, decision-making tool. Um, so today I would like to welcome more than 200 e-participants uh, coming from uh, various organizations. Um, I'd like to say good morning from the people coming from Americas, uh, good afternoon for the people coming from Europe, uh, Africa, and the Middle East, and uh, good evening because we have some also people joining from uh, Asia Pacific. Uh, as you can see, we have a lot of people coming from the industrial world uh, on the food and bev, uh, cosmetic and healthcare, mining, oil and gas and power, a big range also of um, People coming from uh, the consulting world, uh, non-profit, NGOs, and government and institutions. But where I'm very pleased to see is that we have also uh, people coming from the financial community, uh, from some banks, uh, from uh, insurance company, And so that's already a very positive sign uh, that we are in the right track in this journey of sustainable progress. Uh, because once again, what I'm going to present today is not so much a tool, it's not so much a methodology, but it's a change management lever. Um, I can see from the industrial world, we have a lot of people coming uh, from sustainability, environmental management, and so really uh, those metrics, this is really a way to engage the financial community and the chief financial officers. Uh, so once again, think about that as a change management lever further than just a pure methodology or pure uh, decision-making tool. So what I want you now is uh, just to take a step back, uh, grab a cup of tea or a cup of uh, coffee, and um, just to get started, uh, I would like to, to, to play a small game with you all. So as you can see on this slide, we've got nine dots, and so I'd like the e-participant to grab a piece of paper, uh, grab a pen, draw those nine dots. So what we're going to do, the idea is to try to connect those nine dots uh, using four straight lines in a row. So try to connect those nine dots once again uh, with four straight lines in a row. So it can be tricky actually and, uh, and um, here's the way we can connect uh, uh, those nine dots uh, with four straight lines uh, in a row. I think the challenge, that's what we're going to do today, is really once again to step back uh, and have a different view of uh, our business as usual. And as you can see uh, in this example, the only way to connect those nine dots is really to go 
beyond the traditional perimeter. So you have to go outside, basically, of the slides uh, that was displayed on the screen. And that's exactly uh, what the true cost uh, of water is about. Because when you deal with water, you know, when you want to engage decision makers, usually uh, talking about cost, people have in mind two main things. The first thing is about capital expenditures, meaning the price of the water infrastructure when you're going to build a drinking water, a wastewater treatment plant, or process water treatment plant. So that's what we call the capital expenditure, the cost of the infrastructure. Then what's coming behind that to run uh, your water infrastructure, usually you need energy, you need chemicals, you need consumables. Uh, so that's what we usually call the operating expenditures. And that's by factoring those different numbers, that's the way you assess if it's, if it's economically speaking a good project or not. But water is very different, and that's what I'm going to try to highlight today. There are a lot of hidden costs uh, that really need to take into account if you want to drive sustainable progress and sustainable growth. And outside the traditional capital expenditure, outside the traditional operating expenditures, there are other costs uh, and risk that you really need to monetize once again if you want uh, to increase your competitiveness, but also if you want to ensure sustainable progress. Uh, what I'd like to take the opportunity of this webinar is very, very briefly to introduce uh, the company I'm uh, delighted to work for. Uh, Veolia Environment, uh, which is truly a partner for municipalities, but also large industrial players for sustainable progress. Uh, and I will share a little bit later on what, in, what we mean by that. Um, it's a combination of uh, water management, energy management, and waste management. Uh, headquarters in France, but with a business unit and operation all around the world. And today, I'm going to focus more on the water side, obviously, as the topic is the true cost of water. So I'm not going to detail the portfolio uh, and the value proposition, but just wanted to highlight uh, four initiatives. So for example, did you know uh, that Veolia has designed and is currently operating a carbon neutral wastewater treatment plan for a pulp and paper company in Germany? When I say carbon neutral, it's truly carbon neutral, meaning offsetting with the biogas production, the scope one and two emission, but also the scope three emission. Did you know that in Australia, uh, we are able to treat wastewater for industrial uh, players, uh, for the municipal market, but also for irrigation? Recently, uh, in New York, we came up with an innovative business model where we no longer have revenue related to water volume treated, but now through incentive and uh, savings we can generate for the cities. And the last example, uh, moving from science fiction to reality, did you know that in Brussels, uh, from wastewater, we're able today to produce biodegradable plastic, bioplastic. And maybe I should add just this one, you know, the terrible typhoon uh, that recently hit uh, the Philippines and Veolia is currently providing a uh, mobile drinking water unit uh, to the people impacted uh, by, this, uh, by this storm. <clears throat> so once again, I think why uh, Veolia is today promoting the true cost of water, once again, our core business is to provide solution and outsource uh, expertise. So, but for us, uh, you know, we, we know that globally in the world, there's a big range of solutions that are already exist to tackle the main uh, societal challenges when we talk about carbon uh, footprint, when you talk about water footprint, for example, when we talk about resource footprint and ecosystem challenges. So the solution today really exists to tackle the challenges to reduce environmental footprint of a country of a municipality, of industrial players. But the true, the challenge, and I'm sure we've got a lot of people around the, this webinar that will share this view, the challenge is really to demonstrate the true payback, to demonstrate that, economically speaking, it's worth to invest to tackle uh, those societal challenges. And I have to admit, uh, I had the chance to meet with 
many different decision makers all around the world. And I can tell you uh, the only metric that is really important, the only green metric that is really important is this one. You know, the economic footprint. So when I say green metric is the green of the dollars, you know, if we're not able to really demonstrate the economic benefits of investing, of going into sustainable progress and ready to be able to scale and not just to limit ourselves to some pilot initiative that will be useful for some nice CSR report, you know, the only way to scale is really to monetize, is really to put a price on externalities, is really to demonstrate once again the true payback. And so that's what the true cost is doing, obviously, uh, on the water perimeter. Where I'm very pleased, I think, is uh, to see that the risks related to water, the blue risk, uh, are more and more well recognized. And recently at the World Economic Forum, uh, we could see uh, that water supply crisis was ranking as the second top risk impact um, by, the, once again, the World Economic Forum, just beyond a major systemic financial failure. Um, and I think it's really interesting to see global economic development and also to balance that, again, water challenges. And actually, water is not usually where the growth is. And it's actually predicted that 70% uh, of the GDP will be produced in water scarce area by 2015 if we stick with business as usual scenarios. And, um, you know, what I think sometimes it's easier to engage decision makers than with carbon management uh, because it's already impact the bottom line of many companies. So just taking five examples today, but we've got hundreds, or I should say almost thousands of examples showing that water has already impacted badly uh, the bottom line of uh, industrial companies, but also municipalities. Uh, recently, in Spain, the city of Tar Tarragona has really experienced some big water challenges, and they had to import water uh, by boat from France with a cost going up to $30 per cubic meter of water. In Vietnam, recently, uh, we had some uh, challenges of water conflict, reduced allocation, and the impact with a poor company in Vietnam has been a loss of up to 400 uh, million dollars. We always talk about water scarcity, but actually too much water, this is also something really tricky to manage. And uh, recently the floodings in Queensland, Australia had a very bad impact on the coal mining sectors uh, with an impact of up to 2 billion uh, loss. So usually people have in mind operational risk related to water, but there's also some big reputational risk uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of mining companies, for example, are experiencing uh, challenges and sometimes losing their social license to operate because of uh, uh, challenges around water. We see more and more, obviously, on the food and beverage, but also in this example in the mining sectors where some jewelry uh, in the U.S. say they will boycott the gold uh, coming from some specific mine because of bad water and ecosystem management. So this is the kind of things you really can start to monetize once again to try to balance, uh, you know, the journey from pure CSR, corporate social responsibility, or really going into the chair, shared value journey. Recently, I was really impressed uh, by the report uh, of Deloitte and uh, the Carbon Disclosure Project uh, about water risk management, uh, and I really invite the people to go through uh, this report, it's very well done, and I think really we see the trends of people and decision makers starting to understand that water is not just about, about volume, it's about quality, it's about stress, and there are really some risks uh, that really need to be analyzed if you want once again to unleash a new wave of growth. The only challenge I see with that uh, is that yes, operational risks are well known, Financial risks are well-known. Reputational risks are well-known. Regulatory risks are well-known. 
But actually, if you are not able to translate that into the green footprint, the green of the dollars, um, so it's, it's really difficult then to engage decision makers. So what we decided to do uh, within the company, and uh, this is something once again uh, that we're ready to share with different decision makers uh, as a platform to see uh, collaboration and unleash once again shared value. Uh, we're trying to, to, to assess what is the direct cost of water, what is the indirect cost of water, and what is overall the true cost of water. On this graph, what we can see on the bottom is the likelihood of a cost of a risk. On the left side is the impact, which is expressed in dollar per cubic meter of water in this case. The size of the bubble, uh, the criticality, is the multiplication of the impact by the likelihood. So when you want to assess your true cost of water, what you do first is to look at your direct cost, so meaning how much you're purchasing the water, and usually it's, it's, it can be free sometimes. Uh, what is your capital expenditure? So the meaning the water cost infrastructure. What are the operating costs? You know, the cost of your chemical, the consumables related to water. And so that's the kind of things that people start to assess also at the site level, but along their supply chain. The next step uh, is try to understand that you're paying a lot already, some companies, uh, for resources, environment, and water. It's already on the balance sheet of many companies, but sometimes people, they don't realize it's a cost associated with water. So let me a little bit provocative here, and I just want you to look at those two uh, babies. Okay? So the first baby, uh, he wants to be an environmental activist. All right? The second one wants to be an industrial mining developer, uh, once again, because he wants to extract from the ground uh, the goods that will be really useful on a daily basis uh, with all the tools and uh, devices we're using, once again, on a daily basis. So once wants to be an environmental activist, uh, and the second one, once again, want to be an industrial mining developer. What I really like uh, in this comics is the, actually the third baby that is sleeping very, very well. He's sleeping very well because with those tools, he's going to become a wealthy lawyer. And so, the, once again, it's something a little bit provo provocative, but what we see, we see a lot of money spent on CSR. We see a lot of money spent sometimes on public affairs. And sometimes when we've got conflict, uh, you know, you're paying wealthy lawyers. And I think really the idea is to try first to monetize those costs already as an indirect cost and then to try to move away from that and go more on the co-creation of shared value and move away uh, from the pure CSR, corporate social responsibility. So this is the kind of things, you know, you can allocate some of the part to the water and also this will be something that will be added to your direct cost as indirect cost, but cost already internalized. Then you need to look at your externalities, and so that's really the game-changing part uh, where you're going to try to look at the different risks that a company uh, or municipality can face and also uh, try really to monetize those risks. Here it's really a basic example, uh, but this is the kind of things we can have if you've got a conflict, water conflict, and you might have some reduced allocation. Um, you might have some uh, pollution that will have some costs related to remediation, but that can also lead you to uh, a loss of social license to operate, for example, with strong impact on the production, but also uh, you might lose some opportunities uh, to, grow, uh, to grow your business, for example. So there are many, there are many different risks, and obviously if you are a municipality, if you are in the cosmetic or food and beef, that will be a really different risk than a power, oil and gas, and mining company will face, obviously. And so we have developed in the background many different models and scenarios that uh, we're ready to share uh, as a way, not try to have a perfect assessment of uh, the, the, um, the true cost of water, but at least to start to have a good order of magnitude. And uh, we've been working with some uh, municipalities and industrial leaders and it's quite surprised to see the gap between 
what people are aware of in terms of direct water cost and what actually for them is the true cost of water. Once again, the idea is not to scare the people, it's just to educate and uh, bring that to the, uh, to the decision makers uh, with a metric uh, that people feel comfortable with, once again, uh, the dollar value. Here's just sharing an example, uh, obviously for confidentiality reason, I cannot share the name of the customer, but uh, of a mining company uh, that was looking for a growth and that's the business margin forecasted for 2015. When you start to integrate actually the true cost of water, once again, you've got some big uncertainty, uh, but even it will try to show what could be the impact uh, on the bottom line if you go in the business as usual and not putting in place the right mitigation strategy at the site level, but also along the supply chain. Um, once again, if you are a food and beverage company, if you are a cosmetic and healthcare company, what is really important for you is to really understand the gross margin of your product. Uh, here's just an example um, about the gross margin when you start to integrate the distribution, the freight, uh, the resources, the energy, the labor. Usually water is tiny, is really small. Um, and in this example, when we started to integrate the true cost of water, you really can see that it can strongly impact uh, the gross margin. I think something that is really important, uh, the importance of risk mitigation is not so much about um, the threat, it's not so much about the risk, but it's also to try to identify what are the opportunities that you can capture. And I think that's really a key message today. And um, because if you promote that to some of the financial people, they will be quite scared about that. And really what we need all together is to highlight the opportunities, the collective opportunities to go into a different journey. So here what I've done, I've just listed uh, a few examples of opportunities that we start to unleash once again with some decision maker. First, it's about competitiveness. You know, if you have a good management of your risk uh, and water, as you know, uh, it's really growing at the agenda. So this is really something you need uh, to look at your site level, at the municipality level, at the regional level, but also once again along your value chain. I'm a strong believer about this new journey of uh, co-creation of shared value, and we need to move away from a corporate social responsibility, but really try to, how can we together maximize profit while tackling uh, societal challenges? And so once again, this is something uh, that to have that kind of tool expressed in dollars, that uh, will be a fantastic lever to engage a uh, decision maker into this journey. More than license to operate, uh, I prefer to talk about license to growth. And, uh, Today, when you're going to engage a CFO, for example, a chief financial officer, when you want uh, to engage high-level decision makers, you really need to be able to demonstrate what could be the financial benefit. If you're able to better master your water risk, your blue risk, your environmental risk, today you're going to be able to optimize uh, your insurance premium, for example. And I can tell you that it can represent millions of dollars. The cost of capital is something really critical also. And now what we start to see is not just uh, extra financial rating companies, but pure financial rating companies that are starting to discuss with us about those degrees and try to use those metrics as a way to rate differently uh, companies. And I can tell you if those guys are starting to look at those metrics, you know, we really be able to transform once again the journey. And, you know, I'm just taking this example of, of Moody's, a famous rating agencies. You know, they're starting to release paper uh, for the mining sector, for example, but I'm sure you will be able to find that for other industrial sectors. Uh, paper trying to really show the importance of water risk, the way we can monetize them, and really what are the opportunities uh, behind that. So I'm really confident uh, that we are really on the right track. And once again, I think a little bit of promotion of the company. Uh, the technology are there. 
the solutions are there in terms of ecosystems, in terms of, you know, producing phosphate out of wastewater to tackle some challenges of the food, energy, water nexus. And there's many, once again, solutions. Um, but the challenge is to demonstrate the true payback. So we should not limit ourselves to look at capital expenditure. We should not limit ourselves to look at operating expenditure. But let's uh, go outside the slides. Let's go outside the nine dots uh, and try to look at the externalities and price them. And so that will be the way together that we can demonstrate the true payback and uh, unleash a new wave of uh, sustainable growth. So that's really the idea. Uh, I think, once again, it's a very complex topic, uh, but it's something that really people can take ownership of it uh, to engage, once again, decision makers uh, and the financial community. And so something we're ready uh, to share uh, really broadly. So once again, it's a teaser, so please don't hesitate to ask questions, uh, have discussion with us, and I think, uh, once again, I really want to thank uh, Two Degrees for the opportunities, and I'm ready uh, to take uh, some questions for, let's say, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Thank you very much for your time. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Johan. Um, that was a great, great overview there and, and insight into uh, what's been done. So we'll start, we'll go straight into the question and answer session now. And um, a good question maybe to open with. Um, so, Johan, Ofwat in the UK has introduced an approach of total expenditure, TOTEX, rather than CAPEX and OPEX. Um, do you have any sort of views around this concept of valuing water in these models? Yeah, I think to do some total cost analysis, this is something good. But uh, I think the only challenge is not to try to, to price the value of water. Um, because there are a lot of emotion uh, behind water, and there are some stuff you cannot really price, personally speaking. And, um, you know, I'm always do the comparison with health and safety, for example. You cannot price the life of someone. You cannot price, you know, um, um, uh, the, the leg of someone if he's got a big accident. But what you can price is all the, the campaign, uh, health and safety campaign, what you can price is also uh, the insurance uh, uh, fees that you are going to, to put in place. So I think really my recommendation is to focus on cost and what Offwatch is currently doing, I think it's uh, already in the right direction mm -hmm. that we should need to push that. But once again, there's some hidden risk uh, that we should not forget and that maybe uh, sh could be bring into the models. Thanks, Johan. Um, another question, and this has come in from someone in the um, NGO sector, but they're asking, do you see a change in mindset amongst investors, i.e., do they really care? <laughs> That's a good question. And uh, yes, they care. Yes, they care because they start to see the dollar value behind that. So I think it's really interesting to see, you know, the move from uh, social uh, responsible investment, all the green funds, you know, trying to move more with shared value investing, how they can maximize their profit once again by tackling some societal challenges. And there are some banks, there are some insurance companies, some insurance brokers that start to realize that once again, um, if you are a, a CEO, if you are an, a sustainability director, uh, you can be afraid of risk, but the financial committee is something is quite risky. That means there might be some big opportunities. So they start to understand the big risk behind water, and so there might be some good opportunities. But once again, you need the right metric, and you need the right portfolio of company of, uh, to work with. So yes, they're coming into the game, but it's a long journey, so that's why we need uh, more people, once again, to follow this leadership exercise. But yes, I'm really confident um, uh, that uh, the financial sector is coming into Great. the game. A, a follow-on question to that. Um, someone's asking, is there a greater focus, or is this greater focus on water footprint going to be driven by commercial interests, i.e. profit and brand value concerns? And to what extent will regulation and intergovernmental activity set the agenda? <laughs> That's a good question. Just the first thing on water footprinting, I think what I'm very pleased to see is that people are moving away from a pure volumetric water footprint. 
they start to really try to understand the water um, impact index, uh, I'd like to say, trying to look at the quality and the stress factor. Um, you know, I think uh, working with some leading uh, B2C companies on the food and beverage sectors and, uh, and cosmetic, healthcare, pharmaceutical also, um, there's been a big push about environmental labeling, uh, but I think in the current uh, economic summer, I would like to say, I think, um, you know, the, the driver is still the cost, but I think it's more about the social license to operate. And so more than the branding, the social license to operate, or I would like to say the social license to growth, this is something really important. And, um, and personally, I'm not sure that it will uh, be coming from the government, but that's not Veolia speaking. This is just a uh, UN clear view. Uh, and I think when I start to see the journey of some leading um, industrial company such as Coke, uh, Pepsi, Unilever, or Nestle, uh, L'Oreal, for example, uh, GSK, um, Carlsberg, for example, when I start to see really those journeys, people really trying to understand uh, the risk around the sustainability, the supply chain, sorry, I think we are really in the right, right track, and I believe that's more the industrial sector that will drive this change. Um, by engaging the financial community once again. Great. Thank you, Johan. Um, another question, and this is coming from someone in the um, food and bev sector, and they're asking, um, what are the possibilities, and do you see greater, greater um, opportunities for recycling water in the future? Um, and they're talking about grey water into potable water. Yeah. You know, I think it's, um, it's uh, reused water, um, two examples I'd like to mention. There's a very famous uh, a beverage company uh, headquarters in the U.S. They start to reuse now uh, the, um, the water uh, in their process. I think we're going to move away from the psychological barrier of reuse because being an engineer, I know that uh, you can really treat water as a high purity level. And in the Middle East, in the municipal um, sector, you know, uh, because of the local religion, uh, you had some religion rules that will say you cannot use uh, wastewater sometimes um, uh, for irrigation, for example. And when water scarcity is very high, you know, we start to see a change in mindset. So once again, the technology are there. Um, some real leaders are ready to move away. The challenge is to justify the payback. So if you are a, um, a financial officer, you come I'm coming up with a, a project of reusing because it's good for the people, it's good for the planet. It's really hard to demonstrate that it's good for the bottom line because if your price of water is, let's say, $1 per cubic meter of water, you know, it's so cheap that your payback might be 20 years. And in the industrial world, you know, usually you need to demonstrate a three years payback. And so that's exactly what we, we do with the true cost of water we're trying to change uh, the net present value calculation by integrating those externalities and really try to demonstrate, well, the payback on the direct cost um, uh, seems very long, but when you start to integrate and monetize the risk, this is when it starts to be of use. So the technology are there. We've got industrial leaders and municipal leaders that are ready to, uh, to engage into a new reuse journey. Uh, the challenge is to demonstrate the true payback, and so that's why I believe this tool is really a game-changing uh, methodology. Thanks, Johan. Um, another question that's come in, which is related, is somebody's asking, do you think the cost of water is going to rise? And is, are there particular geographic regions which you think will experience this first? You know, I, I think the, uh, in the, um, the municipal world, you know, some people are facing some real challenges, you know. And so... Um, I think it will be um, it will be the decision of local the, the government to um, to to decide about the price of water you know uh, and if they want to subsidize it. Um, but what I, I start to see is that uh, we're going to move away from water as a commodity, uh, especially once again from the industrial world, and so water more and more will be seen as a risk. So the direct cost of water might decrease. Um, because of uh, the economic uh, challenges for the people, uh, because, you know, everybody should have access to uh, safe drinking water and wastewater infrastructure. But overall, the true cost of water is going to increase uh, in the future. 
But once again, behind risks come big opportunities. Thanks, Johan. I mean, following on from that, some, someone in the manufacturing sector is saying, you know, payback won't drive the investment that's needed. Um, how do you get longer-term investment? I mean, have you, have you got any views around that? <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Yes, we see um, industrial players, municipalities, sometimes investing in solutions that have a, um, 18 years payback, 20 years payback, because they want to showcase something, you know, uh, because the, um, there are some big social license to operate issues, so they are going to showcase something. But really, if we want to scale it, you know, we really need to demonstrate uh, that the green footprint is okay, meaning the green of the dollars. So, and so I think, once again, uh, moving from corporate social responsibility, when you're going sometimes to invest in one-shot project, if we really want to scale, um, and unleash a new wave of growth once again and go into the shared value money uh, journey, you really need to engage the CFOs and to demonstrate the true, the true payback. I'm, I'm truly convinced of that. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, next question. Someone's asking, there is often a trade-off between water and carbon. For example, a company may choose to use desalinized water to reduce their dependence on freshwater resources, but that will increase their carbon footprint. So how do you advise companies to manage these trade-offs? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a very good question that uh, we're usually getting. Uh, first, I'd like to say that, uh, you know, you need to look at your environmental footprint. And the environmental footprint is usually a buzzword. Huh? It's something that everybody is using, but when you ask the people to define it, there's no real definition behind that. Uh, but the way I see it, there's the resource footprint, ecosystem footprint, water and carbon. And I think there's no real answer, you know. Um, if you are in a country where there's some big water risk uh, and the, the energy is quite cheap, in the end, okay, there might be a trade-off, but economically speaking, it will be better to invest in reuse solution. If you are in a country where there's some water, but some energy, it's quite uh, expensive because, you know, you don't have a lot of hydrocarbons locally or the government didn't put the right incentive for renewable energy, so the price of energy is quite expensive. Uh, maybe it's better to, when you deal with water, to try to produce biogas out of wastewater treatment plant uh, to lower your energy cost. But I think uh, the only metric, you cannot choose between uh, carbon footprint, water footprint, resource footprint. The only metric that cares, once again, that is important, is the dollar. So like the true cost of water, you can assess your true cost of carbon. You know, you can go beyond the price of the oil price. You can go beyond the CO2 uh, current price because you can start to map uh, and monetize the risk of climate change, the risk of floodings, for example. And so by doing the true cost of rare earth, for example, the true cost of nickel, the true cost of carbon, and the true cost of water, in the end, you're coming up with a dollar value, and that will be the way, I guess, I will recommend the people to decide. Great. Thanks, Johan. So I'm conscious of time, but I think we've probably got enough time for a couple more questions. Yes, um, and there's someone from the services sector which, who's asking, to what extent could preventative measures in the catchment rather than end-of-pipe solutions contribute to managing the water impact index? Yeah, I think, um, once again, it's another key point. Um, I think that's what I like in the shared value journey um, is that it's about collective impact. So this is something that is, uh, you know, usually we're dealing, as a good example, Veolia directly with a municipality, for example. Then we're dealing with a mining company directly. And then on the side, we're dealing with some manufacturing side of the food and beverage companies, for example. And uh, we, we sometimes provide some isolated solution and uh, actually, uh, if you want to mitigate the risk of reduced allocation of water conflicts, maybe the idea is really to look at a more holistic approach and move uh, from water treatment to watershed management. Uh, but once again, you really need to have the right people around the table that might have different drivers and, um, and maybe try to look at some shared value models, meaning once again, maximize profit by tackling social challenges and I'm a strong believer that the metric where you have people uh, speaking the same language is the dollar language. And, um, and once again, I would like to take the opportunity of this point. I, I believe also 
non-profit and NGO will have a very strong role to play in the future um, in terms of shared value measurement um, because this is something that's really key in addition to mapping um, the financial opportunities, making sure also that behind that uh, we, are, we are ensuring that we're tackling some of the local societal challenges. Great. Thank you, Johan. Um, another question from someone in the industrial sector. They're asking, how can I measure indirect costs or how can I convert indirect costs into monetary value? So meaning the indirect costs that are on your, um, on your P&L, so I'm talking here more to industrial players, uh, you can look at what your company is spending in terms of corporate social responsibility. You can look at what your company is spending in terms of public affairs department. You can be, you know, the money that is spent sometimes, um, you know, in legal. You can look at the price your company is paying in terms of insurance premium. Uh, you can look at if your company is losing uh, is rating, uh, financial rating, what will be the impact on their cost of capital. And once again, it's millions of dollars. Then what you do usually, obviously, it's not all about, all about water. You know, there are some, some social challenges. You've got some biodiversity challenges, carbon challenges. But roughly, you can assess maybe it's 5% of my CSR companies related to water, maybe 10% of the conflict I have uh, where I had to pay some uh, wealthy lawyers uh, was about 10% related to water. So it's quite, uh, in the end, it's quite easy to have a good idea about uh, the indirect cost of water uh, on your balance sheet. Great. Well, thank you very much, Johan. Um, so that's all we've got time for for now, but I'd like to thank Johan for his time today and for getting through so many questions, and also for everyone who's joined us for this webinar. Just to remind you all, a recording of the webinar and the presentation slides will be archived on the Two Degrees platform. So I hope you found today interesting and useful and that you'll be able to join us in the future for more webinars. So thank you. Thank you very much once again.